Good day, Grade 12s. This segment of the Boost series of STEM in Action is going to deal with work, energy, and power. My name is Isabel van Gent. It is important that we must acknowledge the exact pre-knowledge that we need as background before we can start teaching or learning this section of Grade 12 Physics. You must know what the conservation of mechanical energy means. You must know the definition. You must know how to apply the definition. Newton's laws, the equations of motion, some basic trigonometry knowledge is very important. You must be able to do vector addition. And the last one, to draw free body diagrams and force diagrams. I want you to have a very serious and good look at the next video clip and to consider how much work is being done once these guys are moving. Ten points up for grabs. Tricky one to call. Let's see how they get underway. My goodness, it's your house who started quickest, but he goes down. They all go down. They're dropping like flies apart from George's Janasia. A quick turn. He's even quicker than Kieliskowski was at the halfway. Remember, it was 19 seconds of change for the pole. Now look at this again. The whole implement must cross the line. Hasn't done that yet. Cut his hands up a bit. It's just another foot. Come on, Constantine. Struggling now, just dragging it across. Got it. That counts. I'm always amazed at at what sort of work this big guys can do. And I hope you actually saw there was a South African too. I think in the third lane. Um, but if you just look at how big those guys are and how heavy those weights must be that they pick up. They must be very strong, and um, I would just think that they've done quite a lot of work. And look at that, Granny. And by the way, it's not me. In a previous life or in a next life. I want you to have a look at Granny and how she will bend down and lift that weight again. And I want you to think carefully, who did the most work? Those strong men carrying those huge heavy weights across the field or Granny? We are only considering the strong men once they have picked up the weights and they are strolling with those weights across the field. I have mentioned that um, Granny did some work and the strong men also did some work. So let's just first look at the definition, the formal definition according to science on what work is. Work is happening when a constant force acts in the direction of motion of an object, work is then done on that object. The formula to calculate how much work was done is given by W is equal to F delta X cos theta. Let's just quickly recap what each of those symbols mean. So W is the um, abbreviation for work in science, F is force, delta X is displacement or the change in displacement, and very important at the bottom, theta is the angle between the direction of the force and the direction of displacement of the object. The diagram that appeared now is actually showing us the angle theta. So F, the turquoise line, is representing the force that is acting on an object, but it is moving in the direction of delta x, the, li the lighter blue line at the bottom. So in other words, the only force that is doing work there is the component of the force indicated by the f in the direction of delta x. So if we look at the trigonometry of that triangle, f cos theta then gives us the component of the force in the direction of delta x. The angle of the force that is applied to an object and the displacement is of great significance because the angle actually determines whether the component of the force that we are working with is either directly in the direction of the um, displacement or not. Let's have a look at example one. In this diagram, 
theta is smaller than 90 degrees. In other words, it is anything between 0 and 90 degrees. And then we, work, we find that cos theta, the cos of, say, for instance, 65 degrees, is bigger than 0. And f cos theta will then be bigger than 0. In the next situation, the applied force is perpendicular to the direction of motion. We can see delta x is indicated um, in the bottom of the diagram as a light green arrow. If we consider theta in this case, of course it's equal to 90 degrees because it's perpendicular to the direction of motion. So cos theta is zero. So then f cos theta, the force or the component of the force that we assume will do the work, does not actually do any work. And at this stage, I want to stand still and refer you back to the strong men carrying those huge weights across that field. Once a strong man has picked up that weight and he starts moving with that weight across the field, I want you to think about the direction of the force that the strong man exerts on those weights. It's upwards because he's actually holding that weight and preventing it from falling to the ground. And in which direction is he moving? Straightforward. So in actual fact, the strong man doesn't do any work while he is moving forward. Whilst Granny, she's got the weights on her shoulders and she is pushing upwards with her hands, preventing the weights from falling. So she's going down and coming up. So the direction of her motion up and down, vertical direction, is exactly the same direction as she is exerting the force on the weight. So Granny can actually show those strong men a thing or two because she's doing work on her weights, but they are not while they are in motion. In the next example, we have changed delta theta so that it is bigger than 90 degrees. So if we punch into our calculators the cos of, say for instance, 135 degrees, we will find that cos of theta is smaller than zero, or the other way to express that it is negative. So you can clearly see if we look at the applied force in this instance that f cos theta, the component of the force applied, will be in the opposite direction to delta x, which is what we expect according to our calculation because the sign in front indicates what the direction of a vector is. This brings us to the next definition, the work energy theorem. And the definition reads that the work done on an object by the net force is equal to the change in its kinetic energy. I would like to show you a very simple little trick that you can use, and you can use it as a game in your own household or with your friends, even with yourself, how, what you can apply to actually learn these definitions off by heart. This is a simple little flashcard. You can use any paper. It doesn't have to be board. It doesn't have to be color. On which you write the term or the, the name of the definition on the one side. And on the other side, you write the definition. So this means that anyone in the household can actually play a game with you by testing you to see whether you do know your definitions. So if you make a set of cards like this for every science chapter, especially for the physics chapters, you can test yourself. Because in physics, it is mostly the case that you can relate the definition to the problem and you know exactly what principles to use to solve a problem. So we have now looked at the words of the word energy theorem. Let's look at the formula the work done on an object by the net force, so that is the work net, is equal to a change in kinetic energy. So that means we are looking at the difference between the 
final and the initial kinetic energy of an object. Where we know from, I think, grade 11 or grade 8, that the kinetic energy is calculated by the formula a half mv squared, where v is the velocity of the object. And just another reminder, when we calculate f net, the resultant force, the definition for a resultant vector tells us it is the sum of the individual vectors. So in the same vein, F net is the sum of all the individual forces. F1 plus F2 plus F3. As we all know in algebra, sum of means an addition sign between the different components. The next definition that we are going to deal with is the principle of the conservation of mechanical energy. This is also something that was covered earlier on in your schooling. It reads as following. The total mechanical energy, which is the sum of the gravitational potential energy and the kinetic energy, in an isolated system remains constant. That translates to the initial mechanical energy of an isolated system is equal to the final mechanical energy. And remember, mechanical energy is the sum of the potential and the kinetic energy. We've already looked at the formula for kinetic energy. It is equal to a half mv squared. And of course, potential energy is equal to mgh, where h refers to the height difference above the surface of the Earth that an object actually um, travels through. In the case of an isolated system, the net force is equal to zero. Just a little, another little reminder, when the principle of the conservation of mechanical energy is valid, in other words, where the initial mechanical energy is equal to the final mechanical energy, we do not have any friction that is playing a role in that system. So as soon as we have a frictionless system for the purposes of the work that we cover in grade 12, we can assume that the principle of the conservation of mechanical energy is valid. On your screen, you are looking at an example of one of our World Heritage Sites, Table Mountain in Cape Town. I want you to imagine the following little story. You've been on a visit to Cape Town for a weekend, a holiday, or you might even live in Cape Town. And there are many nice restaurants in Cape Town, and you went out for a lovely lunch, and of course, as most of us do, you're overindulged. But you planned beforehand that you're going up with a cable car to the top of Table Mountain and to look at the lovely views there from the top. On your way there, you and your friend decided you must better now do something about these full stomachs and decided to get out of the car while the other people are waiting for you at the cable car station and you are at point A, you got out of the car, and you took a stroll up to point B around the bend on the right-hand side. And in the next scenario, you are actually challenged by one of your friends to push the lightest member of the party in a box. So the me member of the party is sitting in the box, and you must push that person from point A to point B, in a box. So we have these two situations. You walk up freely to point B and the next situation you actually have to push someone in a box on the road up to point B. We're coming back to the scenario. You must please remember this silly little story and we're jumping to something completely different. English. I know I might need a lesson or two but um, this is more to to clear up some conceptions that we are using in science. Conserved in English implies to keep something constant. So let's try and link that to what is happening in physics. There is a term, conservative force. So can you recognize the part conserve in that term? Let's see whether something is kept constant in this instance. If a conservative force acts, 
the work done by that force is independent of the path taken and that the mechanical and the total energy is conserved while that force is acting. So can you now see, in this case, we keep the mechanical and the total energy constant and therefore it is conserved stays the same regardless of the path that this fo force is following to do the work. So the total energy initial is equal to the total energy at the end. And that the mechanical energy initially is equal to the final mechanical energy. And a, an example of a force like that is the force of gravity. At this stage, I would like to refer you back to the table mountain scenario. When you just walked from A to B, the only work that your body actually did was to defy gravity. So it is only the height that you gained from point A to B that caused you to do work. So it is independent of the path that actually went to your right, on the picture, took a turn and went up again. So a conservative force acted while you did that and that conservative force as we defined before is the force of gravity. Let's look now at the opposite when a non-conservative force is acting. The work depends on the path. I think if you can just imagine that you had to push someone in a box up that path that you would start sweating because you really worked hard. And the length of the path definitely determined how much work you did. In this case, when a non-conservative force acts, the total energy is still conserved. Because as we know from grade three or four, energy can't be created or destroyed. So the total energy is conserved, but the mechanical energy is not conserved. The initial mechanical energy at point A is not equal to the final mechanical energy at point B. And an example of a non-conservative force is the force of friction. And for the purposes of the grade 12 work, the force of friction will be the most common non-conservative force that you will come across. Let's look at the definitions for conservative and non-conservative force, a formal definition. This is what you will have to write down when it is required of you to define these terms. A conservative force is a force for which the work done in moving an object between two points is independent of the path taken. In our example, the object that you had to move between A and B was yourself. So it is independent of the path taken and the work is determined by the difference in height between the two points. On the other hand, a non-conservative force is a force for which the work done in moving an object between two points depends on the path taken. That is your friend in the box. So here, yeah, the path that you have to take will then determine exactly how much work you had to do. This brings us to another um, expression or formula that we must know that the work done by the non-conservative force is equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. So that's a change in the mechanical energy. So when you apply this formula, it will mostly be that that non-conservative force will be the force of friction. So power is the rate of work done or the rate of change or transfer of energy. The first part of the definition says power is the rate of work done. So that is very simply W over delta T, how much work was done in a certain time. If we now change this formula by substituting some of the quantities with others, according to science, then this formula has all sorts of different faces. But we know that work is equal to F delta X. 
So therefore, we can substitute the W as the numerator with F delta X. And then it becomes P power is equal to F delta X over delta T. But from way back in grade 10, delta X over delta T is equal to the velocity of an object. So therefore, the power becomes FV. So power can then also be calculated as the force acting on an object multiplied by the velocity of that object. So in total, we have the following formula for this section of work. Work is given by the formula F equals F delta X cos theta. And in a similar fashion, where you could learn and study off by heart your definitions, you can do exactly the same for formulas. Most formulas are actually provided in the data sheet, but it's very handy if you do know them offhand. The next formula is that of mechanical energy, where the mechanical energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy at any point. And there's a little asterisk there. And the reason why I put the asterisk there is to remind you that this formula does not appear in your data sheet. So if you need to use this for the purpose of solving a problem, you actually need to remember this. The work energy theorem, the work done by the net force is equal to the change in kinetic energy, and that is EK final minus EK initial. And then the last set of formulae are for power. Um, so where power is equal to the rate at which work is done, W over delta T, or if we substitute it with some of the um, formulas that we know, it can become F delta X over T, or the power is equal to the force that's acting on an object times the velocity. This part of the presentation deals with how to go about when you have to draw a force diagram or a free body diagram. You can name these the rules of those processes. Let's first look at the force diagram. So when you are required to draw a force diagram of an object, you draw the object as a block. Then you indicate all the forces acting on the object in a very specific way, which we will discuss just now. As we can see in this example, there is, of course, our ever-present friend, the force of gravity, and its opposing partner, the normal force. And then we have a force F, that is the force applied to the system, and our other ever-present friend, the force of friction. Now, these are the more serious rules. An arrow shows the magnitude and direction of each force and must touch the box. In any normal situation, if an, if an object is moving in any direction, the force of friction is normally much smaller than the force applied. So you can see here I drew a shorter arrow for the force of friction. We, uh, this is just an arbitrary example that we weren't given any, any values. And also, the arrow must be in the position where the um, force is exerted on the block. So there are these things. An arrow must show the magnitude and direction of the forces acting and must touch the box. I would like you to look at um, the force of gravity. And I started the force of gravity in the middle of the box because that is how we represent the force of gravity acting on an object. As it is acting from the midpoint of that object and not only where it's touching um, a surface. Right, that takes us to what are the rules of a free body diagram. So now we take our exact same object, but we draw it as a dot, a big dot. Not something like this that someone must go and look for with a... Um, magnifying glass, a nice big dot. Once again, we indicate all the forces acting on the object. Each arrow must touch the dot and point away from it. 
and a force at an angle, very important. Often we get a force that is acting at an angle to um, the horizontal surface. In that case, we do one of two things. Either we draw the force itself where it is acting and at the angle more or less that it is acting at, or its components, not both. So it is either situation B or situation A. You do not use situation B where we have indicated the vertical and the horizontal components, the component of the force parallel to the surface of the object and the component of the force perpendicular to the surface of that object, that situation or that situation. Most of the problems that we encounter in grade 12 are not as simple as the object being on a flat surface. So now we must look at objects that's on a slope. Exactly the same rules apply, except that you draw the object on the slope. Indicate all the forces acting on it, shows away from the object, magnitude and direction correct, and you must draw the arrow where it is exerted. If we draw a free body diagram of that situation, once again, we draw the object as a big dot. Indicate all the forces acting on it. When you are required to draw a free body diagram, it is very handy and very helpful to actually f first draw a force diagram because it just helps you to orientate yourself with regards to the direction of the forces. And an arrow shows the magnitude and direction of each force and it is pointing away from the dot. And then the last one, we are going to look at the components of the force of gravity. So there it is indicated as the force itself. And the next situation is, so either we draw it as the force of gravity as indicated at the moment, or the components of the force of gravity parallel to the surface that the object is sitting on or lying on or moving on or perpendicular to the surface. Please note that if we calculate the component of the force of gravity in this case, the magnitude is exactly the same as the normal force. The normal force is just in the opposite direction. We will refer to this later on in the presentation. We have looked at all the theory concerning work energy and power and now it is time to apply that to some old exam questions. We're going to take paper one from March 2018 and look at question number five to practice our problem solving skills. Question five states that there is a slide, PQR, at an amusement park and it consists of a curved frictionless section PQ and a section QR which is rough, straight and inclined at 30 degrees to the horizontal and the starting point P is 3 meters above the point Q and the straight section QR is 5 meters long. A learner with mass 50 kilograms, and it is already underlined because that's not indicated in the diagram, starts from rest at P. So we can immediately write in the, that V of the learner, initial V of the learner is equal to zero. Important information. We will redraw this just now. And continues down the straight section QR. That is where the problem statement stops at this stage, so our learner hasn't gone further than Q at this stage. 5.1 asks us to state the law of conservation of mechanical energy in words. Already written that out for you, and it reads the total mechanical energy of an isolated system 
remains constant. We can relate back to the formula that says the initial mechanical energy is equal to the final mechanical energy so that we know that the total mechanical energy is constant throughout. Question 5.2, calculate the speed of the learner at Q. If we look at our diagram, P is the initial starting point and Q is the point for this trajectory where the final velocity has to be determined. So if we can say P is the starting point, so that is where we will look at the initial situation and Q is the final point and we will take that as where whether it be kinetic energy or whatever where the final um, motion is taking place for that little section of the diagram. So we need to calculate the speed of the learner and we know that the section between P and Q is frictionless. So the principle of the conservation of mechanical energy will be valid. So we can say the mechanical energy at P would be equal to the mechanical energy at Q. Mechanical energy is the sum of the kinetic and the potential energy. So mechanical energy at P P would be E P at P plus the E K at P. And write that differently. And that would be equal to the potential energy at Q plus the kinetic energy at Q. E P is M G H plus a half M V squared. That is all at the initial point at P, and that is equal to mgh plus a half mv squared. Both of those quantities, the final point F, which is at, at the final point, which is at Q. If we substitute our quantities, we know from our initial drawing, also from what we marked there, that the mass of the learner is 50 kilograms. So it's 50 times 9,8 gravitational acceleration. The height where she was initially was 3 meters from the ground, plus a half, 50. And V squared initially at the top at P is equal to 0. That is equal to what happened at the end of that little journey down PQ. So the mass is still 50 times 9,8. And this time we take that as the difference in height from the top to the bottom. So she has arrived at point zero there. Plus a half 50. V final squared. That is at point Q. If we take out our calculators and we calculate the different quantities times 9.8 times 3, that part is 1470 plus a half 50 times 0 is 0 is equal to 50 times 9,8 times 0 is again 0 plus a half times 50 times V squared final. Should have made that Q. Of course, the final velocity is at point Q. We can simplify this equation further. So 1470 is equal to a half of 25. A half of 50 is 25 V squared final at point Q. 
if we make v squared, subject of the formula, 1470, we have to divide it by 25 on both sides to get the 25 away. So that is equal to 1470 divided by 25. And that gives us an answer of 58,8. If we want to calculate the final velocity in this case, we have to take plus minus the square root of 58,8 square root of 58.8 and that gives us an answer of 7,668 we must use two decimal places in this case and because it's a square root it is plus minus and of course the unit is meters per second if we refer back to the question, it asks us to calculate the speed of the learner at Q. In this case, plus and minus indicates the direction of um, the person who was moving. And because it only asks us for the speed, which is a scalar, it does not have a vector quantity, we can now write that V is equal 7,67 meters per second, which only has a magnitude. We can now continue with question 5.3, and it asks of us to draw a labeled free body diagram for the learner while he or she is on section QR. If we refer back to the diagram in the paper, QR is that section where they said it is not smooth, it's a rough section, and our friend friction is definitely there, but we're not worrying about that straight right now at the moment. So it is best to start off with a force diagram before you um, draw your free body diagram, as that helps to indicate to you exactly what should go where. So 5.3, we're just going to do a free a force diagram to start off with. That is 30 degrees. We draw our learner as a block. And now we must analyze what are the forces that is actually acting on the learner why, while the learner is going down from Q to point R. Or ever present the force of gravity. And then its opposing friend or enemy the normal force and then because this is a rough surface the object will be moving this learner will be moving from Q to R our force of friction is always opposite in the direction of the motion so we would have our force of friction acting at that point so if we now convert this into our free body diagram, we draw our object as a dot. All the arrows must touch the dot. That is the force of gravity. More or less the same magnitude for the normal force. And then we have our force of friction at the same angle of about 30 degrees to the horizontal. And that would be your um, free body diagram. Just be careful when you use um, this configuration on your answering sheet that that doesn't appear as your answer. So perhaps rather do your force diagram on a separate piece of paper so that only your free body diagram appears under 5.3. The examiner might just think that you weren't sure which was which. So just a little warning in connection with that. They say the coefficient of kinetic friction, mu k, between the learner and the surface of section QR, QR, is 0, 0,08. So let's just write that down. 
and k is 0, 0,08. Calculate the magnitude of the kinetic friction of force acting on the learner when the learner is on section QR. I am just grabbing our previous diagram so that we can just make sure that um, we have all our facts straight and that we have a visual reference of what is happening in this situation. The force of kinetic friction is given by the formula mk the coefficient of friction times the normal force. I just want to refer back to our diagram and point out that we do not have a value for the normal force. And in this case, because it's on a slope, the object is on a slope, the normal force is not equal in magnitude to the force of gravity. So we need to break up the force of gravity in components because the force of gravity has got a component perpendicular to the surface as well as a component parallel to the slope. And the, over there, that is the component of the force of gravity that is perpendicular to the slope. At least in that sketch, no one will have um, any doubt whether that is perpendicular or parallel. So we, it is much clearer now that the magnitude of the normal force is equal to the perpendicular component of the force of gravity. So how do we go about to calculate this? That is why we said right in um, at the stage when we look at the pre-knowledge that we need some trigonometric um, skills to solve some of these problems. So in this triangle between R there and where it touches the object, that angle is 90 degrees. So that angle over there is 60 degrees. That angle is 90 degrees. So that small angle between FG and FG perpendicular is equal to 30 degrees. In order to calculate FG perpendicular, we need to resolve FG in its components, and for that we're going to use basic trigonometry. So that angle between FG parallel and FG perpendicular is 90 degrees, so we can work with this triangle. So FG perpendicular is the adjacent side to the 30 degree angle. And we can calculate what the value is of Fg because we know the value of G and we know um, the mass of the goal. So in this case, Fg perpendicular is the adjacent side to the 30 degree angle. And then we can calculate cos of 30 degrees is adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is Fg. So the adjacent side which is equal to Fg perpendicular is equal to H, the hypotenuse, times the cos of 30 degrees. We'll just rewrite that. So Fg perpendicular is equal to H, which is Fg, H, the hypotenuse, times the cos of 30 degrees. So just a note here, the normal force, which we are actually after, is equal in magnitude to Fg perpendicular. And that is equal to Fg cos 30 degrees. So in this case, we can now replace the normal force with that calculation. So if we now want to calculate the force of kinetic friction, we can use mu k, 
Fn, our old formula that we should know. Please note, this is also not in the data sheet. Mu k, they g gave us to 0 0.08. Fn, we now know, is Fg cos 30 degrees. And that is equal to uh, 0 0.08 times 0 0.08. Fg is equal to Mg cos 30 degrees, 0, 0,08. The mass is 50 times 9,8 times the cos of 30 degrees. 0, 0,08. And the answer to that is 33,95. We've calculated the magnitude of a force and therefore the, the unit is newtons. We have one more question um, in this section that we have to complete. Let's look at the last bit, question 5.5, and it asks us to use energy principles to calculate the speed of the learner at point R. At point R over there, we know now that the slope is at an angle of 30 degrees. The distance from Q to R is 5 meters. So if we have to use energy principles, it means that we have to make use of kinetic energy and potential energy. There are other options as well, but I think that is the clearest and the easier option to use. In this case, we do not have the difference in height between points R and Q but we do have enough information to calculate that. If we close up our triangle, we can once again use trigonometry and find out what is the value of that side which represents the height between, between point R and point Q. That is the opposite side, and we have the value of the hypotenuse. So, we can use the sine of 30 degrees is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse. H here stands for hypotenuse. The opposite side, opposite, is equal to the height in this case. So, if we make opposite the subject of the formula, we get that the opposite is equal to the hypotenuse, which is 5 meters, times the sine of 30 degrees. So the height is equal to 5 times sine 30 degrees, and that is 0.5. Meters. Often the um, the memos of the exam papers do all these things in one huge calculation. I myself prefer to break things up into little bits and make sure that um, that I have one thing at a time that I can substitute and plug into my formulas. So if we use energy principles, we can use the formula that the work done by the non-conservative force, our friend the force of friction, is equal to the change in mechanical energy, which is equal to the change in the kinetic energy plus the change in the potential energy. The force of friction has a value of 33,95 newtons. So the work done by the non-conservative force is equal to the force of friction. The force of friction is acting down the slope. Delta x and the cos of and the angle between the motion and the, um, the force of friction, the direction of the force of friction is 180 degrees and that is equal to a half m v squared 
um, final minus a half mv squared initial plus mgh final minus mgh initial. Fix that plus up a bit. So if we just rewrite this formula and take out the common factor to make it easier to populate, cos of 180 degrees, it is equal to, so a half m is the common factor. We look at the kinetic energy situation here, v squared final minus v squared initial. And for the potential energy, we can actually take out mg, and the height final minus the height initial. If we now populate our equation with values, 33,95 was the force of friction, the delta x down the slope was 5 meters, the cos of 180 is minus 1, and that is equal to a half times 50. The final velocity at the bottom that is what we want to determine, the final velocity at point R, V squared final at point R, minus the initial velocity at point Q. We actually calculated in 5.2, so we need to go back to 5.2 and just get the answer. It was 7,67. Right. plus mg is 50 times 9,8. The final height at r is 0, minus, we calculated the difference in height there, so the initial height at q was 2,5 meters. Now we need to simplify all of this. So on the left side of our equal sign, we have 33.95 times 5, times negative 1. And that answer is equal to negative 169,75. And it is equal, if we simplify that, 25 times v squared final at r minus 7,67 plus, plus 50 times 9.8 490 times negative 25. So we end up with minus 169,75 is equal to, if we calculate that in, it's 25v squared final minus 7.67 uh, squared times 25, 1470,72 minus 49 times 25, 1225. If we solve all of this, we get 169, which is negative, comma seven five plus one four seven zero comma seven two plus one two two five is equal to twenty five times v squared final at point R. We get an answer of two thousand five hundred and twenty five comma nine seven is equal to twenty five times v squared final. So therefore v squared final is equal to 25 9,7 divided by 25 and it is 101,04. So therefore v, and once again they ask the speed, is plus minus the square root of that, 
So if we take the square root of 101.04, we get it is 10,05. And because it's a square root, it's plus minus meters per second minus 1. And they are asking of us to calculate the speed. So the final speed would be 10,05 meters per second. And because it's a scalar quantity, the velocity is a vector and speed is a scalar. So the answer is 10,05. We do not have to bother with any direction um, that we must supply to the answer of this question. And herewith we come to the end of this section. I hope you have learned enough that it gives you enough courage to tackle lots of work energy power problems. Yeah.